Hello everyone, I'm Joris de Grote from the Department of Flow, Heat and Combustion Mechanics, uh, more particularly from the Fluid Mechanics Research Group. Um, we focus on fluid structure interaction and computational fluid dynamics. And in that regard, we have been using Open Foam for some time. Like in 2009, we developed, together with Selko Tukovic, uh, an, an uh, FSI solver, so fluid structure interaction solver in Open Foam. And in 2011, we de developed an uh, adjoint solver for FSI in Open Foam. But because today this meeting is organized by the HPC team of uh, Ghent University, I focus on large eddy simulations. Because for this kind of simulations, uh, HPC is really indispensable. If you try to do it on a simple workstation or a laptop, it just doesn't work. So I picked out three uh, LES simulations that we have done over the past years and also very recently. So slot jet, tube bundles and anaerobic flows. Um, and then at the end, I will also look at some practical aspects of running open foam, especially here on the HPC of Ghent University and on the tier one infrastructure in uh, Flanders. Um, before I start, just a brief introduction about what LES is. Probably all of you are familiar with it, so I won't take too long of your time. So in the DNS, direct numerical simulation, if you simulate a jet, more or less looks like this. All of the scales are resolved. If you then go one level down, go to a large eddy simulation, you sim still simulate most of the scales, but the very small scales are modeled. And then if you go all the way down to Rans simulations, Reynolds, Aviets, Average, Navier-Stokes, you get very smooth picked figures because all the small scales and large scales of the turbulence have been modeled and you can't see them anymore. So in an industrial context, Rans is still used very much. And this is what you typically see then. But the reality is, of course, much closer to what happens in a DNS. But as you see here, in a DNS, the number of operations that you have to perform scales with the third power of the Reynolds number due to grid refinement requirements and time step requirements. This means that you can only <coughs> afford relatively low Reynolds numbers of the order of magnitude of a thousand or maybe a couple of thousand just because otherwise the computational cost is too high, even for very big supercomputers. The Reynolds number um, of this order of magnitude is not yet uh, applicable in most industrial applications. For instance, if you go to uh, airspace um, or like the flight of an aircraft, then your Reynolds number is of the order of a million, so way too large to do a DNS. For large eddy simulation, because you model part of the turbulence, the small scales, you can already achieve higher Reynolds numbers, 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth, with HPC computers. Um, but still, you, you see that uh, doing an LES of a full-scale aircraft would be probably too much. Uh, and so then you are in the order of 10 to the sixth, and that's still uh, pushing the limits of what can be done at this moment. However, in advanced simulations, simulating an aircraft, that's fully possible. Reynolds numbers of 10 to the 6th or even higher can be done. But there is a lot of modeling. And uh, the more you model, the higher the uncertainty or the, the influence of your model on the results become. So that's why there is a tendency, especially in research, to move from advanced simulations towards LES and DNS where it's feasible. OK, probably you're familiar with things like this. So in DNS, you resolve all the scales, from the large scales to the small scales of your turbulence. In rounds, you model all of it. And LES uh, and hybrid methods like detached eddy simulation, they are somewhere in between, where you model part of the turbulence and you really resolve part of the turbulence as well. So let's now look at three cases where we did large eddy simulation. The first one is a slot jet. This slot jet is a very academic case, but it comes from the gas turbine uh, industry. So gas turbines are used as aircraft engines and for power generation. Um, and the turbine blades, they are subjected to very high temperatures. So you need to cool them or they just melt off. And part of the cooling is done with impingement. So at the inside of the blade, there's cool air and it impinges on the outer wall of the turbine blades to cool them. Of course, this is quite difficult to simulate, 
And that's why academic benchmark cases have been developed, which contain the basic physics of such an impingement cooling. And a very basic test case is a slot jet. So here, at the top, you have a narrow gap of your fluid domain, and the entire brick here is the fluid domain, and some air comes in at the top here through this gap, and then impacts on the bottom of your fluid domain. And this is representative for a cooling case. And then you can calculate the heat transfer here that happens due to the impinging jet. Um, for this case, we have done um, large eddy simulations with open foam. Um, you see some details about the schemes that we have been using. Um, also, some different calculations have been done for Reynolds number 10 to the fourth. As I just mentioned, 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth in LES. That is uh, feasible at the moment with uh, the clusters that we have here. So 10 to the fourth here as well. Different geometrical ratios. And then here in the end, I mentioned the number of cells. So 7 million, 15 million. Uh, that's the order of magnitude of the number of cells that we used in this case. So it's not that terribly large for an LES simulation, actually. Um, this is already a simulation from a couple of years ago. I mentioned here this has been done on 1,000 cores of gulping. Gulping, that has disappeared. How long has this cluster already disappeared? About two years. Uh, it's okay, yeah. So it's getting a bit old here. So, um, But just to show also how this um, performed and then to show what the current architecture can already do compared to what we had previously. Here you see some results. This is the average velocity in this red plane, so in the side plane. The velocity of the jet comes from the top and then impacts on the bottom, but due to the impact, of course, it diverts to the right and to the left. If you have a, then a top view of the bottom, the jet comes in over here and then spreads to the right and to the left, and you see um, the Q criterion close to the wall, uh, to the bottom wall. So th this is a typical view of an LES simulation, so not these smooth pictures, but very chaotic flows due to the turbulence in the flow. And the Reynolds number 10 to the fourth uh, in this case. This is the scaling at that moment. Uh, it doesn't look too great, right? So if you increase the number of nodes, you see that the parallel efficiency was dropping to even 40% in the last case. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. I did this myself, so I can say that it was actually done not with the best uh, ideas here. I mean, there are some mistakes have been made, but we should learn from them. Uh, on 32 nodes, the decomposition was done just with a simple decomposition or hierarchical. Uh, it was first split in the Z direction, that's the width direction, then in the Y direction, which is the, the vertical direction, and then in the X direction is the longitudinal direction. Yeah? You see here 32 decompositions in the X direction because there were 32 cores per node. But then you have to think what is actually being done is that all the, all the subdomains that are on one node are actually in one very narrow longitudinal piece. So there is a lot of communica communication with the other cluster nodes. This was actually really stupid. Yeah? So this also this says, or this partially explains why the scaling went down so much. Also because the cluster hardware <coughs> is already a bit older, it's really it's already two generations back, so the hardware is also a bit to blame. But also this choice of the decomposition here was really not optimal. You shouldn't put them all the domains next to each other. They should be more or less in a cube, or something that is as close to a cube as possible, per cluster, per cluster node. Yeah? Uh, one other number that is important here is 15 million cells. If you have 1,000 cores and 15 million cells, you have 15,000 uh, cells per core, which is really on the low end. And typically, well, okay, it's maybe, maybe it's still feasible on very, very good hardware, but it's really on the low end. Uh, probably you should go a bit higher. Um, just there is not enough work per core. It will mostly do communication, especially on this older hardware. Okay, so this is more or less as a historical perspective. Now we go to a bit more recent uh, LES calculations that we have done. Um, they are related to tube bundles, so a bundle of tubes with internal and external flow. Due to turbulence-induced vibration and flow-induced vibration in general, they can start vibrating. And then the tubes, they um, 
rub against the clamping plates and to other, they can also rub against each other. And due to this friction, they can start wearing off, they can break. And in some cases, if it's um, for a nuclear reactor, then if they break, uh, radioactive liquids can leak. Uh, also, if it's just if it's a heat exchanger without nuclear uh, fluids, then it also means that the performance of the heat exchanger goes down because they have to plug some of the tubes. So breaking of the tubes is really undesired. And we investigated the turbulence-induced vibration in such a tube bundle. Um, this is actually the work, the work of the master thesis of Laurent de Murloso, who is sitting there on the first row. <laughs> um, what we saw in these tube bundles is that if you look in the gap, at the gap in between two tubes, that uh, vortices occur. If you look at the velocity in the horizontal direction, you see red and blue spots, which means positive and negative velocity. So at some points the velocity goes like this, at other to the left, and so we have a, a path that looks more or less like this in the gap between two tubes. Um, this has been simulated with large eddy simulations for an infinite array. Well, uh, so we look at one tube and assuming that there is an infinite number uh, of other tubes around it. This means that we can use periodic boundary conditions. As you can see, the geometry is really simple, so meshing wasn't really a problem in this case. Um, these simulations had about 5 million cells, but we also had to do a lot of time steps. This is a problem that Brecht also mentioned. Of course, the number of time steps uh, scales up your simulation time, uh, and domain decomposition isn't really going to help you for that. Um, uh, here you see a result of this simulation. So this is a typical animation of an LES flow. So here we see the velocity magnitude in the boundaries of your box, so in the mid planes between two cylinders. And here you see uh, the vertical structures and the gaps between the two cylinders. So you see here this meandering flow in the gap between the two cylinders. This is exactly what we wanted to investigate. Um, we looked at different pitch over diameter ratios, and the pitch is the center to center distance between two cylinders. The diameter, yeah, the, the diameter over the cylinders. And uh, here you see the Struhal number, and this shows the, the relation between the Struhal number and the pitch over diameter ratio. Yeah. So all of this work has been done on the HPC infrastructure during the master thesis of uh, Laurent and his predecessor as well. Related to this topic, so this was a tube bundle, we also looked at annular, annular flows, which is is the tube inside a bigger tube, so an annular region. This is actually also ideal to do LES simulations because the geometry is really simple. So the meshing uh, can be done with uh, the standard tools in open foam. We look at the pressure spectrum on the central tube and uh, how the pressure causes vibration of this central tube. Yeah. Um, in this case, the Reynolds number is uh, 10 to the fifth. Yeah? So uh, in the beginning I mentioned 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth. That's what you can do with LES at this moment. Um, this simulation was started on 8 million cells, but we went up to 176 million of cells, uh, which in the end, if you would do it on a single core, would have taken uh, 25,000 days. Because here you see single core 0 0.1 second, and we did 0 0.25 seconds, so 25,000 days for a single calculation on a single core. Yeah, that's obviously not feasible. You have to use HTC for these things. And this was done on the previous um, generation of the tier one infrastructure, up to 2,000 cores. This is a cross section of this analog geometry, and you get the, the figures with the velocity magnitude, and you see they are very inhomogeneous, you have the typical chaotic structure. Normally, for an engineer, you will then average them out, and you see, as you refine the grid, that your velocity profile converges towards uh, a converged solution. We also look at the forces on the central tube, that's actually what we are interested in. Um, you see a, 
the power spectral density of the force per meter of length of the tube. So we average over the circumference and we can calculate the force then. Uh, there are some experimental values, and you see that the different grid resolutions, they give quite similar results, which don't fully ag agree with the experimental values. But we also show here the correlation that is typically used in industry at this moment, and you see that even though there is still a difference with the experiments, that the simulations already provide much better data than what is currently used in, in simple correlations in industry. Okay. So this was a very fast overview of three different alias calculations that we have done over the years. Um, maybe I use them a bit as an example, as a, as a starting point for the explanation about the domain decomposition. So some things that you have seen while working with open foam on the HPC infrastructure in Ghent and in the tier one. Um, this is a scaling test. Um, yeah, probably you find a lot of them on the internet as well. But this is one particular for the infrastructure that we have here. It's a case that you have probably all seen. It's the cavity case with ICO foam. So uh, uh, a box with a velocity at the top, and then you get a swirling flow inside the box. Uh, we do strong scaling test here on two different grid resolutions. So this means we make a certain mesh, and we run it on a different number of cores, keeping the mesh size fixed. Uh, so this is called strong scaling. The procedure was actually to make a very coarse mesh, the block mesh, to decompose it, uh, and then to refine it, and then uh, to run the solver on it. If you would uh, use block mesh to generate the initial very fine mesh, it would really take an eternity. And so you, you do actually uh, distributed mesh generation just to go very quickly to the fine mesh. We have to take into account the hardware to a certain extent to get good scaling. So one node of Brainiac, the computer on which we have run, have been running this test, contains 28 cores, which are actually split up in four groups of seven cores. And this information will be used in the domain decomposition as well. Uh, for some of you, this may not be necessary at all. This is really only necessary if you go really to a very large number of CPUs. If you run on one or two nodes, I don't think you have to think that much about what's really in the node or how it's split up. But if you want to go to really large cases, you have to start thinking about that. Uh, for this case, we used multi-level domain decomposition. The, the domain decomposition first has been splitting up the domain using the number of nodes. So here we have the domain decomposition for 3,584 cores. So we first split the domain in 128 nodes. Yeah, so first the decomposition per node. Uh, this was just a simple decomposition, so 16 in the x direction, 8 in the y direction, giving 128 nodes. Within each node, so then from going from level 0 to level 1, within each node we have 28 cores split up in four groups of seven cores. Yeah. So, this multi-level decomposition avoids the stupidity that we had with the slot jet, where all the domains were actually in, in, the, in, a, in the wrong uh, way. They were next to each other instead of in a cube close to each other. But well, here it's a rectangle and not a cube, but okay. So here the, the domains which are on a single node are also geometrically close to each other. And they, they are split up in the same way as the structure of the machine uh, itself. So this is for 3,500, this is 7,200 um, cores. So the, the, the composition per node is the same, it's just the node structure which is a bit different. Um, so how have we done this? Well, it takes a bit of hand calculation on a sheet of paper. Um, you first create a coarse mesh, and in this case the number of cells in this coarse mesh was not arbitrary. It was chosen such that you had um, unit numbers of cells if you were splitting up um, your domain using the decomposition that we needed. Yeah. Um, for instance, here, for 3,584 uh, cores, um, 
we had a, we split it up until we had 64 domains in the x direction and 56 domains in the y direction. Um, in the end, we had very small domains. There were only 56 cells, <coughs> seven in the x direction and eight in the y direction. So if you multiply here 64 times seven or 56 times eight, you should get 448 cells, right? Um, this was the coarse mesh. Then we refine it five times in the x and the y direction. So you should multiply seven times 32, so 2 to the fifth, and 8 times 32, take the product of that, and then you get, after refinement, 57,000 cells per core. Yeah? So we go from 56 cells to 57,000 cells per core, yeah? so due to the refinement. Uh, but this refinement is done per core, and then it's really fast. I mean, generating 57,000 cells on a core, that's really okay. If you would do it with block mesh on a single core, it would take forever. I mean, it's really, it's almost impossible. Um, in this graph, you then see the speed up. If you go from uh, one node to uh, 3,584 cores, you see the, the speed up is more or less ideal yeah? for this case. Obviously, it's a very simple case. Usually in more industrial geometries, it won't be possible to decompose the domain so nicely. But as we have seen, the LES simulations that we have done, this analog geometry, there yeah, you can split it up pretty nicely. The slot jet also, actually, if you do it a bit cleverly, you can split it up really nicely. So it's, for a lot of geometries, two tube flows and so on, you can actually decompose the domain <coughs> with some thinking in a pretty nice way. So, I've, seen, I've shown you the, the bad scaling from the past, but at the moment, I think it's pretty okay. Then, if you actually only refine the domain only four times, so we end up with 51 million cells instead of 200, then you see, if we try to go to 3,500 or even 7,200 uh, processors, that in the end, the scaling, the efficiency, it drops. And so the, for the largest two, the efficiency is actually uh, lower than here in the sweet spot of the scaling. A um, couple of reasons for that is that the number of cells per core becomes really low. So I already mentioned it before, 15,000. Sometimes it works, but it, it gets really low. I mean, the, the work to communication ratio becomes relatively poor. On the other hand, if you have uh, too many cells per core, then the cache size becomes insufficient, and so effects like that start to play. Um, I don't want to say that you really have to worry about this, but yeah, it's just as a background information. Uh, you don't need to use all of the things that I have presented here to work with OpenFold. It's only if you go to bigger cases. All right. Now, I think this is the most dangerous part of my presentation. If I get some track, probably it's for this slide. Uh, I try to compare open foam with Fluent to a certain extent, and I want to say very clearly, this is an opinion, this is not a fact, this is not a scientific comparison, it's just my, my point of view from, from these two, having used uh, both of them. Uh, a couple of positive things about open foam, especially in comparison with ANSYS tools like Fluent, is that you have access to the source code, but this should not be, yeah, be a, a holy uh, advantage. A lot of people won't use it. Uh, they won't look at the source code. They will just use the solver. In that case, it's more a virtual advantage than a real one in some cases. In other cases, it's a, a necessary advantage, of course. You don't need uh, license fees. Um, so, especially if you want to go to thousands of cores, yeah, then it's a clear advantage. If you only intend to do small simulations, you actually would be quite surprised to see how low the license costs are compared to the time that you need to set up an uh, open foam simulation. So, the salary uh, license cost benefit, yeah, the trade-off definitely has to be made in some cases. I've personally experienced how open foam enhances the collaboration. So, on an inter international level, I, have, I would not have been able to do some of the collaborations that I did without open foam. 
the partner was using open phone, <coughs> I was using it, it was open source, it was easy. While if it's with commercial tools and licenses, it's really a disaster. Um, I think the acceptance in the scientific community of open phone is much higher. People will sometimes look strangely at you when you say, I work with a commercial tool. I think it's also much more fun to play with than with Bruin, but that's a personal opinion, of course. There are also some downsides, of course. Um, my feeling is that the validation that is being done in open foam is still less systematic. I don't say that there is less validation, but less systematic. Because yeah, it's distributed in different <coughs> groups and different fields. Well, uh, the people from ANSA, they have a well-structured procedure when they have a new version, they do certain tests, they all, always do the same tests. They have people paid to do that, so that's, <coughs> yeah, that's a difference. Documentation is not always of the same quality, although there is a lot on the internet, of course. Um, sometimes features appear in Fluent before they appear in Open Foam. Sometimes they already exist in Open Foam, but only some groups have it. It's not publicly available. Um, the different branches, that's sometimes also a bit a nuisance. Um, I think is also something important is the longer learning curve. If you want to develop in open foam, you need quite good C++ skills. I spent quite a uh, couple of months in my PG learning C++, and I think that paid off for me. But if you don't do it, working in open foam or developing in open foam can be quite painful. If you don't know what the templating and the pointers and so on, what they do, you can spend a lot of time without much results. Uh, so. Sometimes it's better to spend some time studying C++ before starting instead of trying and playing and because it can be quite frustrating then as well if you don't see what is happening or if you don't understand what it's really doing. So related to that point, I would say if you're alone in a group working with open phone, yeah, try to partner up with someone either internationally or at Ghent University, uh, especially if you don't have yeah, uh, C++ skills or so, something like that. Depends, of course, on what you want to do, like using or developing. That's a different, uh, that's a different perspective. But again, this is just a feeling. I mean, this is not the truth. Uh, definitely open for debate on this one. All right. So to conclude, uh, we did some LAS simulations in open foam. Um, <coughs> One of the main messages is, if you want to go big to big simulations, that you have to think about your domain decomposition. Also communicate about that with the HPC team, they can help you with that. Um, in the previous years, there was only very limited amount for open foam in our CFD course. I think Black here was the only one ever doing it with open foam or asking anything about open foam. But now that you see that the community asks more from open foam, I think next year we will switch to the to open foam for the exercises. And the theory they will stay the same, but the exercises will be done in open foam instead of in uh, fluent. The project, like Brecht did, can already be done in open foam. Uh, but uh, that's uh, that's something for next year. All right. So thank you for your attention. Any questions for Yoris? If you do this multi-level decomposition, uh, how do you make sure that the structure that you have in mind, so this certainly inter nodes uh, or in a single node, uh, the four times seven, that actually these packages that are close together actually end up on, on that processor core? Um, but this is something that is done by the MPI, the pinning. Uh, so if you have uh, processor zero, one, two, three, four, six, mm -hmm. um, five, sorry. Uh, then, then they will be on uh, core 0, core 1, core 2. They are more or, more or less automatically by the MBI package put in the same order. Yeah, that, that's on uh, playing around and trusting on the MBI pinning between yeah, the order of the it's processors. Not some, it's not something that you can specify to that level. Like the packages that I generate will, will end up, and you don't have to make a link yourself between the host file. And, and your decomposition. No, that's something I haven't done in this case, but I could observe <coughs> on the, oh, yeah, yeah. That, that this was actually done, that the processor numbers, the core numbers, sorry, actually match the 
the numbers of the processors that uh, that was used. I think this is called the, the rank pinning uh, in the API process. Uh, here it was uh, accidentally it was okay, so I didn't have to change anything. But I, uh, in other cases, you might have to contact the HPC team to help you with doing the pinning in a different way, so that the processors or the, the parts of the domain which are geometrically close to each other, that they're also pinned in the right way in the, on the cores of the, of the machine. That's part of my API when does it takes care of the pinning of processes to cores. And by default, I think it does a, just takes, like, like Yuri said, uh, process zero, core zero, process one, core one, then they are close to, close to each other. If it's slightly different, depending on how your case is split across cores, you can tell it to do something different as well, like random or cycle or, yeah. So, so by default, it, it should do a pretty good job. Right. I would like here on the default, zero, domain zero, processor zero, uh, yeah. on that kind of thing. Yeah. That's what I mean. But indeed, you can probably do uh, When you refine the coarse mesh, is the boundary layer grading respected? Ah, and that's a that's a good question. In this case, it's uniform mesh, so there you can just refine. Uh, in other cases, if there is a boundary layer gradient, you would have to uh, yeah, write a bit more clever block mesh, which keeps the grading in the refined mesh as well. I think that's possible, but in this case, we didn't have to do that because it was uniform. Any more questions? No? Okay. Thank you, Joris. <laughs> now it's time for lunch.